Welcome to a show about things you can see without going far, and a lot of them are free. If you thought there was nothing in the old hard land, you ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Randy does the steering so he won't hurl. Mike got the map, such a man of the world. That's Don with the camera, kinda heavy on his shoulder. And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out the world in their own backyard. Checking out the world in their own backyard. So, um, yeah. next stop, Buster Brown. It's kind of scary, I think. He's well healed. Dear TV mailbag, is that what they mean by a tease? Hi, Don, the cameraman here, and if we ever get out of this motel parking lot, we will start looking for more unusual art and offbeat attractions. I just take the pictures, and they take the credit. Though four producers, I guess they're doing okay with that Polaroid. Gee, it looks just like the last one. This is Sykeston, where we'd spent the night after gorging ourselves at the home of Throat Roll. We're back at the ball's request for a commemorative photo in the Lambert's parking lot. And on the way out of town, couldn't help but notice more of what we'd like to think of as local color. Proceeding then to the south, we experienced a part of Missouri that none of us had ever actually seen before. You might say we flew through steel and escaped the lures of Hollywood. Our destination down here, Hornersville, is not exactly a big place. In fact, its claim to fame is that someone small is buried here. Don't feel bad if the name Major Ray doesn't ring a bell, but you've seen his face on many a box of Buster Browns. Laura Ford was so impressed by the love between the Major and his equally diminutive wife that she's written a novel about them. During the 19, like early 1900s, they had retired. He and uh, Jenny retired from the circus and opened a grocery store. And he sold Buster Brown shoes. And so the, the uh, retailer from Brown Group would come down, deliver the shoes, and he'd sell them out of the store. So one day he came by and Tig and Major were sitting next to a pot-bellied stove. And the guy came in and just looked at him and said, my Lord, said it's Buster Brown and Tig. And that's where the idea came about to use little people. How tall was Buster Brown, or Major Ray, I guess? Major Ray was 37 inches tall. He was considered a pituitary dwarf because the pituitary gland didn't kick in until he began work with Brown Group and he grew seven inches. That's practically growing out of your occupation. <laughs> did he change shoe sizes? Was yes, he did. Question. And Ty did tricks. Oh, well, yeah. I didn't know that. I, I thought yes. he was just an accomplice. No, Ty did tricks. <laughs> In fact, he would take the shoes uh, from people's feet. He would untie the shoes if they didn't have brown shoes on. <laughs> no, oh. no, come on. They met in Kansas City. Major and Jenny did. She died in 1915, and when she died, he sent a picture of her along with her measurements to a sculptor in Italy. And that man sculpted her as an angel and sent the monument back. And it was rumored that it cost $15,000 in 1915. We've had people from California come out just to see this monument. Um, and especially now, I'm getting a lot of calls from people all over the country that want to know exactly where it's at. Well, now maybe it was the touching tenderness of that love story caught in stone or the pastoral beauty of the countryside, but right there, Mike blurted out a startling confession. I never had Buster Brown shoes. You I'm never feeling, had Buster Brown I'm shoes? I'm feeling a little left out. <laughs> The thing is, when you're in Hornersville, you're just a serious spit away from Arkansas. But that might be against some law, so we decided to save our saliva and head back to the north, moving up the boot heel to what I like to think of as the Achilles tendon, which, as we all know, ruptured pretty big back in 1811, near a little town called New Madrid. 
In 1990, the media was all over this place, looking for it to happen again. But on this April day in 96, we had it pretty much to ourselves. What's in your museum? Well, a whole lot more than there used to be. Turns out they financed their expansion by selling t-shirts for something that did not occur. Okay, so now I'm sitting in my home, I'm comfortable, everything's mm -hmm. good. I'm on sand, though. Yeah, and all of a sudden, an earthquake happens, and there you go. Wow, just like that. And okay, so we could liquefact, or we could look at the seismograph, but not today. Huh? Not today, because its parts are missing and it's not working. So if there was an earthquake, we wouldn't know. No, oh, not, not today oh. you wouldn't. This is about Richter scales. This is a museum where you could actually learn something, which is the kind of yeah. museum we usually stay away yeah. from, I have to admit. <laughs> did it really run backwards uh -huh. for a while? Did the river, the river did. Mm -hmm. Mike wants to know, where does the water go when the river runs backwards? What, well, what happens? I don't know. I can't explain that. Well, we have a, I said, a sophisticated Indian exhibit. The village that they uncovered was a thousand year old. These people probably moved because there was an earthquake. <laughs> well, it was settled by the Spanish. And then they kind of gave up and went back to Spain. <laughs> I've never known it to be New Madrid, but I'm sure when the Spanish came, that's what he was going to, you know, farm a new, new Madrid. <laughs> and we have a real good uh, exhibit of the Civil War. Ah. And see, we did have a battle, the siege yeah. of New Madrid. Mm -hmm. Look at this mm -hmm. hog chain. That was one big hog. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's for a boat. That's Mike, a boat. Oh. give me a big hog. <laughs> uh, Talk about your rare visions. Guys, I'll tell you. What with this and that thing this morning about the shoes, I'm starting to wonder if too much travel might be getting to Mr. Murphy. Frankly, what he needs is a break from all this navigating and researching, and what better time than this long haul up the eastern side of the state? Most relaxing, at least till we realize that another tactical era may have been committed. Arcadia, it says Arcadia, 1898 it was built. Another one of those beautiful round barns like we found in Kansas. Well, and Arcadia's just down the road, right? Yeah, I think so. Arcadia, Missouri? Well, apparently not. Yeah, see, this is going to be a problem because uh, Arcadia, Oklahoma doesn't appear to be on this map. Now I figure no harm, no foul. But Randy says it's going on his permanent record. On the upside, it did give us a chance to drive through the heart of the world's largest lead district and to pretty much keep on driving. When we hit the mighty Mo, we had another decision to make, Daniel Boone or Elvis. We chose the latter and still almost went wrong in Wright City. Seems the Elvis is Alive Museum was already closed. However, there were signs of the king at the very next exit. Girl, I can't walk out because I love you too much, baby. Well, now this is good, but we hear that museum is the whole jelly donut, so rest assured, we will return. I can't walk out because I love you. Now, if you're keeping score at home, you may have noticed that so far the shows have less art and more attractions. But that's about to change in a big way here in the big city if we ever make it through this St. Louis traffic. We're headed for Ken and Kate Anderson's place. It's not a gallery, just where these two artists live and work and keep adding to their collection of grassroots, outsider, visionary, naive, whatever you want to call it, art. The kind of stuff that's made by people who haven't been to school for it, but obviously have something to say. What you're seeing is just sort of a hodgepodge of all the different objects, and the house filled up, and so it was like, what you know, we can't stop, so we just fill things up. And, and you know, it used to be the old idea was like, um, less is more. Well, I don't know. We've gotten to the point we think more is more.
This is a collection that was uh, discovered in uh, 92 in, in uh, Rhinebeck, Iowa. Um, kind of came to light at a farm auction. And um, the significance of it is, is that there are literally hundreds of pieces that the Woolseys, uh, Grace and Clarence Woolseys, produced um, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They were bored to death. It was cold Iowa winters. Uh, they started by getting some bottle caps and making a, the first thing they made was a little mailbox. I think the figures are probably the most outstanding part of what they, they did. Um, they would have kids all around the uh, uh, neighborhood riding their bikes from filling station to, to store collecting soda bottle uh, caps. And all of a sudden, it, it blossomed and filled uh, their, their farmhouse. One of the things we found very consistently is that um, people retire. They want, then they want to do something. When you talk to them, what happens is they retire, they decide they want to start making something, they go to their garages, they see what's around them, they start putting things together, and actually in a relatively short period of time. Does the ARC fit into that too? ARC fits into that really easily. Um, I think he's produced maybe about four of them now, and he's 88 years old, he's probably, he's 89 now, um, and all of a sudden he just, he's, his wife talks about, we went and visited him. She says, oh, he, he gets on one of these arcs and then he, I just don't see him for months. He's just gone. So he's in the basement day and night working on these things. Um, and they're just amazing in terms of the, the expression that he gets out of all these different animals. There are bats, monkeys, possums. One of the things I, I always liked was that the lobsters are red, so they're cooked. The way he puts things together, uh, he, little uh, examples, like, like for instance, the moose with these strange kinds of horns made out of, I guess, nails and little pieces of wood up. The paint surface, the paint marks and things are just, uh, uh, has a kind of almost a abstract expressionist kind of feeling about it. Um, and this person is totally untrained. He's totally in terms of, of artistic. He just, he does what he wants to do and he just gets a kick out of doing it. Should there be one of the, a museum, and should you guys be the instigators oh, of such a thing? I fully believe we were. We've talked about this that um, 20 or 30 years ago, there was very little in African art museums or wings or whatever. Now our own museum has a huge wing. Used to be a little room. Uh, it's my firm belief that folk art is going in that same direction. There already is an American Visionary Museum uh, of folk art, whatever that, whatever the, their their real name is. Um, in Baltimore has opened up. Um, lots of museums now are collecting folk art. It's just a matter of time we will be taking over. The world had best watch out because as you can see, Kate does walk softly and carry a big baton. <laughs> anyway, as a parting gift, the Andersons helped us ornament our hood then sent us further into Forest Park to look for the Museum of Quackery that we'd heard about some time ago. I'm sorry, however, to say that research again may have gone awry, and the woman in the box was none too friendly. What is this, one of those cable access TV oh. shows? <laughs> we just thought that a museum of quackery would be worth stepping into, so if you're not open anymore, I guess we can't. Yeah, we're not open. You have to go to the Science Center. What kind of stuff is over there now? Scientific stuff. <laughs> but what kind of stuff was here that they took over there? Uh, medical instruments, like from the past. Things that didn't work, is that why, why they were over here? No, that's not it. Quackery, I thought it was stuff that was, you know, supposed to work and didn't. This is not a quackery. If you want quackery, go to the park and look at the ducks. <laughs> No, not exactly the kind of welcome that makes you want to stick around and check out the arch or the zoo or the train station or those silly Clydesdales. So we drove right on out of Missouri into Alton, Illinois to find one of those guys Ken told us about making the most of his retirement years, John North. Well, I saw in a magazine, uh, it had something similar to that. I said. I think I can do that. So these are made up from scrap, like old throwaway Venetian blinds, coat hangers, lumber. 
and I just rigged it up myself, you know, went into motion with it. Somebody said, make me some boxers. So, I got some guys duking. It's Noah's Ark. All the other animals are already on there. These are the last ones going on. <laughs> he started putting these up. He said it's for his grandkids. Um, I mean, I think it's more for John than his grandkids, but that's his, his idea that he's going to, you know, they like to look at him. And a lady asked me, can you make me one a lady playing a piano? I mean, I said, sure. So there's the piano player. <laughs> oh, this couple not getting along too good. A lot of times they're very innovative in terms of, you know, they want to figure out things and how things work. So in this example, you know, it's like as you, you know, this, he's got all eight reindeers with all their feet going. You have them up on a fence or something, they just run like crazy. The wind does a great job and he does a great job at keeping everything kind of in balance and, uh, and works well. When I was smaller, I used to make a lot of kites too, you know, like butterflies, different things. See, I went to school, night school, when I was working, I'd take an arts in general, like ceramics, leather craft, interior decorating, oil painting, all that. So I just put them all together and made something out of it. I don't advertise, they advertise themselves. <laughs> I, don't, I don't put no sign out or anything. Seeing so much of John's ingenuity, whirly gigging away up there on the fence, inspired us to see what he thought of our own ingenuity, or the lack thereof. This is all videotape. You got, got any it tips is. for us? Yeah, this has been winding sort of a tiny little ball. So, so now it's kind of heavy. It's certain. Oh my goodness. What do you think? Are we, are we on to something here? Are you, are you sure there's nothing underneath that? No, as Randy says, it may be stupid, but it's got no cereal filler. Speaking of Paul, while in Alton, we continued our quest to play catch in every state we visit, here on the site where Lincoln and Douglas did debate. Then it was back across St. Louis, still no arch, heading for a southern suburb called Eureka, where I was assured we would find the shrine of the Black Madonna. Go into these things with an open mind. Yeah, and it only stays open till about six, so we've got about 40 minutes. No, it's not connected to that rock singer. In fact, the name comes from a famous painting that got darkened in a famous fire. And obviously, Our Lady of Chestahova truly did inspire one brother, Bronislaus, to some major heights. It's unbelievable what this man did. All this himself over a period of 23 years. Like I said, cut the trees down, uh, mixed his own cement, used dynamite to get the, uh, the roots of the trunks out of the, the trees out of the ground. And then he would get rocks, jewelry, seashells, different seashells, coral, you can see the little birds that people donated. He used everything people gave him. Didn't make any difference. These flowers are chandeliers somebody donated. They're just turned upside down, and the pillars are made out of coffee cans filled with cement and then covered with cement and the stone. These flowers up here are made out of cupcake molds. And in the archway, you've got marbles and seashells, jewelry. I mean, he did all this by hand. But without any real artistic background in his... In we his... have no knowledge that Brother Bronislaus had any artistic background because when he was in Poland in the Franciscan monastery, he was the cook. Now, this is to St. Joseph, the ground to St. Joseph, and you can see the jewelry and the seashells people have donated. The grotto is, can be very, very simple. It can just be a small cave. But Brother Bronislaus enhanced it and tried to make it as beautiful as he possibly could. This, I mean, is so, I mean, unbelievable. If you look in the other spaces, you'll see red vigil lights and uh, vases. There's blue up there and green here. And when the sun gets at a certain level, when you're in the chapel, you can see the greens and the reds and blues come through. Where the statue of Our Lady of Fatima is, was to be a grotto to Our Lady of Fatima. And he had it all in his mind what he was gonna do. 
and he had shown his superior his plans. And he was so enthused about starting that grotto that he didn't bother to wait for the cool weather to be cutting down trees. And uh, he suffered a heat stroke. And he left his tools and the trees he cut down. And he went up to the corner grotto, which is to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And that's where he collapsed and died. And the brothers found his body when he didn't return to the monastery that night. And I'm sure if he lived, he would have done a whole lot more. These last few days have given us much to reflect upon. And flying down I-70 back towards Wright City, we began to encounter some more icons of the road. I mean, what the heck are walnut bowls? Can't reflect too long, though, because here comes that place we missed the other night, open in all its daytime splendor. That's your better likeness, to tell you the truth. I know that's like a sideburn did. sticking out of the nose. Turns out the man to thank for all this is one Bill Beanie, a local real estate guy who dreamed up the idea of a rest stop for true believers and curiosity seekers. We have uh, pillows, we have Elvis quilts, we have stand-ups, we have uh, the Plaster Paris busts of Elvis, we have clocks. We are distinct and different in that we've got 3,000 pictures that, as, a, as far as we know, no one else has. But we are very distinct in that we are the only restaurant in the world with a museum that says Elvis Presley is alive. We start here with a, uh, a voice of Elvis that has been authenticated by three voice experts. As far as, as, far as she is concerned, uh, uh, many people will stand here and listen to uh, all 30 minutes of this uh, vo vocal voice. People who aren't in a hurry, I'd yes. say. But we have Elvis here reduplicated in the casket. People says, well, the Elvis you've got in the casket doesn't look like Elvis. And our answer to that is the Elvis that was in the casket on August the 17th uh, when he allegedly died didn't look like Elvis either because it was a wax figure. With the uh, wedding chapel here, we performed a lot of weddings uh, here uh, because we had a special room for it. This was a, a sweater that belonged to Elvis. This was a tie. This was one of his rings. My only thought here for a second, Bill, is does this make people hungry? Well, uh, it really isn't compatible with food. And we have off-centered this to where they're not eating their Elvis burger and looking at him in the casket. The next page, we have our pizza, hunka hunka, burning love pizza. Mm -hmm. We have our hound dog, hot dog. And then perhaps the favorite of all is the famous uh, fried peanut butter and banana sandwich, which was, of course, one of Elvis's favorite. And with that, we give a full uh, color photo of Elvis. Now, how can there be profit in that if you give a, a picture of Elvis on top of the sandwich? Well, we actually lose money on it, but it gives us such joy to see the smile on their face. No fried bananas here, just your basic American grub, which we gobble, making sure on the way out we still had time to sit in the car that Elvis rode in. Well, sort of, which pretty well sums up the whole place. Back on the highway, here comes another of those walnut bowl signs. The last we'll see for a while, now that we're getting off the interstate, taking the scenic route along the river, starting here in Herman. Known for its friendly folks, Teutonic roots, and an ongoing love affair with the great. Can't believe the ball wants a glass of wine. I hope he just stops at a glass. You know how he gets. I'm afraid I do. And I've seen what happens when you drink and roll. Whoa. Now, if you're looking for the quickest way across the state, this would not be it. But like the guy writing this says, it's full of visual panache and did eventually put us in the general vicinity of Fulton. Most likely the only town in America with a statue of Winston Churchill standing right next to a big old chunk of the Berlin Wall. To us, it's the site of what used to be known as Sorehead Hill, where Jesse Howard, the granddaddy of Missouri folk artist, constantly filled this yard with signs telling everybody what he thought about everything. I started to make a showplace of this place 20 years ago. 
and I've never had one ounce of cooperation from nobody, anybody, preachers, lawyers, doctors, or anybody. He didn't like the bunch over at the courthouse. He called out the uh, a concentration camp. <laughs> that courthouse. He didn't like the bunch over at all. In Howard's art, which is really interesting, is that it, it's mostly done in it's, it's simply words. And so, but what makes it art and different from just reading in a book, for instance, the word is the way he spaces and places and arranges doesn't almost matter what it says for me. It's how the letters arrange within the rectangle, within the sign, uh, what the pacing is. And he's clearly, consciously putting in those shifts and changes, but I don't know why. I asked some of them one time, I said, why is that uh, that uh, they don't get arrest him for a lot of that talk slower and they don't run people down one thing or another. And they said, well, uh, do you notice that he's got something about the Bible and putting in all them signs? I said, yeah. He said, there's where they could. They can't do anything with him. <laughs> Just kind of grown up in weeds, hasn't it? That's one of the problems with these things is, you know, taking care of them after the artist passed right. on. It's like the, the Anderson said, the paintings by themselves, the, they're not, they don't mean that much, but, but when you put them all together in the site and the location, you know, you, the whole is definitely greater than the parts. I guess we're just lucky they saved some. Now, maybe it's just me, but it seems like there's a great deal of irony at work here. After all those years of fighting with the city, they went and named the street after them. Wait a minute, I'm having a vision. This is Don the Camera Guy signing off. Walnut Bowls, all my life I've wanted to stop here. I've never gotten to stop Dad, here. Dad, can't we? No. My parents would never get off the interstate for anything. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where's Clint? Fingers across. Yes. Double crossed. Double crossed. Bowls, Walnut Bowls. Big moment. This is what we've been waiting for. Well, a second. Well, you know, we are low on tape. Don, be, be careful. Oh, boy. Oh boy! Oh no! Oh no! I'm getting I'm getting a, a tape a tape warning light, guys. Oh! Wait! Oh! Oh! Wait! Wait! Oh! 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 End oh. the tape! It's oh no!